The United Nations Conference on Environment and Development UNCED, also known as the Rio Conference or the Earth Summit Portuguese, ECO-92 was a major United Nations conference held in Rio de Janeiro from 3 to 14 June 1992. Earth Summit was created as a response for member states to cooperate together internationally on development issues after the Cold War. Due to issues relating to sustainability being too big for individual member states to handle, Earth Summit was held as a platform for other member states to collaborate. A key achievement of the 1992 conference was the establishment of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change UNFCCC, established in part as an international environmental treaty to combat dangerous human interference with the climate system and to stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. It was signed by 154 states at the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development UNCED. By 2022, the UNFCCC had 198 parties. Its supreme decision-making body, the Conference of the Parties COP meets annually to assess progress in dealing with climate change. Since the creation of the UNFCC many related environmental conferences, climate-related forums, and ongoing scientific research initiatives in the fields of sustainability, climate, and environmental security have continued to develop these intersecting issues. Non-governmental organizations, NGOs, and educational institutions have been prominent participants. The Earth Summit played an influential role in diffusing several key principles of environmental treaties, such as the precautionary principle, common but differentiated responsibilities, and the polluter pays principle. The issues addressed include systematic scrutiny of patterns of production, particularly the production of toxic components, such as lead and gasoline, or poisonous waste including radioactive chemicals alternative sources of energy to replace the use of fossil fuels which delegates link to global climate change. New reliance on public transportation systems in order to reduce vehicle emissions, congestion in cities and the health problems caused by polluted air and smoke the growing usage and limited supply of water importance of protecting the world's oceans. An important achievement of the summit was an agreement on the Climate Change Convention which in turn led to the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement. Another agreement was to, not to carry out any activities on the lands of indigenous peoples that would cause environmental degradation or that would be culturally inappropriate. The Convention on Biological Diversity was open for signature at the Earth Summit and made a start towards a redefinition of measures that did not inherently encourage the destruction of natural ecoregions and so-called uneconomic growth. World Oceans Day was initially proposed at this conference and has been recognized since then. Although President George H. W. Bush signed the Earth Summit's Convention on Climate, his EPA Administrator William K. Riley acknowledges that U.S. goals at the conference were difficult to negotiate and the agency's international results were mixed, including the U.S. failure to sign the proposed Convention on Biological Diversity. Twelve cities were also honored with the Local Government Honors Award for Innovative Local Environmental Programs. These included Sudbury in Canada for its ambitious program to rehabilitate environmental damage from the local mining industry, Austin in the United States for its green building strategy, and Kitakyushu in Japan for incorporating an international education and training component into its municipal pollution control program. The Earth Summit resulted in the following documents. Rio Declaration on Environment and Development. Agenda 21. Forest Principles. Moreover, important legally binding agreements, Rio Convention, were open for signature. Convention on Biological Diversity. Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC. At Rio it was agreed that an international negotiating committee for a third convention the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification would be set up. This convention was negotiated within two years of Rio and then open for signature. It became effective in 1996 after receiving 50 ratifications. In order to ensure compliance to the agreements at Rio, particularly the Rio Declaration on Environment and Development and Agenda 21, delegates to the Earth Summit established the Commission on Sustainable Development, CSD. In 2013, the CSD was replaced by the High-Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development that meets every year as part of the ECOSOC meetings, and every fourth year as part of the General Assembly meetings. Critics point out that many of the agreements made in Rio have not been realized regarding such fundamental issues as fighting poverty and cleaning up the environment. Malaysia was successful at blocking the U.S. proposed convention on forests and its Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad accused later the global north of exercising eco-imperialism at this summit.
According to Vandana Shiva, Earth Summit create a moral base for green imperialism. Green Cross International was founded to build upon the work of the summit. The first edition of Water Quality Assessments, published by WHO, Chapman and Hall, was launched at the Rio Global Forum. At this stage, youth were not officially recognized within climate governance. Although youth were not given specific recognition, there was a significant youth turnout at UNCED. Youth were involved in negotiating Chapter 25 of Agenda 21 on Children and Youth in Sustainable Development. 16. 25.2 It is imperative that youth from all parts of the world participate actively in all relevant levels of decision-making processes because it affects their lives today and has implications for their futures. In addition to their intellectual contribution and their ability to mobilize support, they bring unique perspectives that need to be taken into account. Two years prior to UNCED youth organized internationally to prepare for the Earth Summit. 18 youth concerns were consolidated at a World Youth Environmental Meeting, Juventud Youth 92, held in Costa Rica, before the Earth Summit. The involvement of today's youth in environment and development decision-making is critical to the long-term success of Agenda 21 Inches UNCED 1992. Parallel to UNCED, youth organized the Youth 92 conference with participation from around the world. Organizing took place before, but also afterwards. Many youth participants were dissatisfied with the rate of change. The United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change UNFCCC, established an international environmental treaty to combat dangerous human interference with the climate system, in part by stabilizing greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. It was signed by 154 states at the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development UNCED, informally known as the Earth Summit, held in Rio de Janeiro from 3 to 14 June 1992. Its original secretariat was in Geneva but relocated to Bonn in 1996. It entered into force on 21 March 1994. The treaty called for ongoing scientific research and regular meetings, negotiations, and future policy agreements designed to allow ecosystems to adapt naturally to climate change, to ensure that food production is not threatened and to enable economic development to proceed in a sustainable manner. The Kyoto Protocol, which was signed in 1997 and ran from 2005 to 2020, was the first implementation of measures under the UNFCCC. The Kyoto Protocol was superseded by the Paris Agreement, which entered into force in 2016. By 2022, the UNFCCC had 198 parties. Its supreme decision-making body, the Conference of the Parties COP, meets annually to assess progress in dealing with climate change. Because key signatory states are not adhering to their individual commitments, the UNFCCC has been criticized as being unsuccessful in reducing the emission of carbon dioxide since its adoption. The treaty established different responsibilities for three categories of signatory states. These categories are developed countries, developed countries with special financial responsibilities, and developing countries. The developed countries, also called Annex I countries, originally consisted of 38 states, 13 of which were Eastern European states in transition to democracy and market economies and the European Union. All belong to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development OECD. Annex I countries are called upon to adopt national policies and take corresponding measures on the mitigation of climate change by limiting their anthropogenic emissions of greenhouse gases as well as to report on steps adopted with the aim of returning individually or jointly to their 1990 emission levels. Developed countries with special financial responsibilities are called Annex II countries. They include all Annex I countries with the exception of those in transition to democracy and market economies. Annex II countries are called upon to provide new and additional financial resources to meet the costs incurred by developing countries in complying with their obligation to produce national inventories of their emissions by sources and their removals by sinks for all greenhouse gases not controlled by the Montreal Protocol. Developing countries are then required to submit their inventories to the UNFCCC Secretariat.
The Montreal Protocol is an international treaty designed to protect the ozone layer by phasing out the production of numerous substances that are responsible for ozone depletion. It was agreed on 16 September 1987, and entered into force on 1 January 1989. Since then, it has undergone nine revisions, in 1990 London, 1991 Nairobi, 1992 Copenhagen, 1993 Bangkok, 1995 Vienna, 1997 Montreal, 1998 Australia, 1999 Beijing, and 2016 Kigali. As a result of the international agreement, the ozone hole in Antarctica is slowly recovering. Climate projections indicate that the ozone layer will return to 1980 levels between 2040 across much of the world and 2066 over Antarctica. Due to its widespread adoption and implementation, it has been hailed as an example of successful international cooperation. Former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan stated that, perhaps the single most successful international agreement to date has been the Montreal Protocol. In comparison, effective burden sharing and solution proposals mitigating regional conflicts of interest have been among the success factors for the ozone depletion challenge, where global regulation based on the Kyoto Protocol has failed to do so. In this case of the ozone depletion challenge, there was global regulation already being installed before a scientific consensus was established. Also, overall public opinion was convinced of possible imminent risks. Montreal Protocol the Montreal Protocol on Substances that Deplete the Ozone Layer. Signed. The 16th of September 1987. Location. Montreal. Effective. The 1st of January 1989 if 11 states have ratified by then. Condition. Ratification by 20 states. Signatories. 46. Ratifiers. 198 All United Nations members, as well as the Cook Islands, Niue, the Holy See, the State of Palestine and the European Union. Depository. Secretary General of the United Nations. Languages. Arabic, Chinese, English, French, Russian, and Spanish. Terms and purposes. The treaty is structured around several groups of halogenated hydrocarbons that deplete stratospheric ozone. All of the ozone-depleting substances controlled by the Montreal Protocol contain either chlorine or bromine, substances containing only fluorine do not harm the ozone layer. Some ozone-depleting substances ODSs, are not yet controlled by the Montreal Protocol, including nitrous oxide N2O, for a table of ozone-depleting substances controlled by the Montreal Protocol C. For each group of ODSs, the treaty provides a timetable on which the production of those substances must be reduced and eventually eliminated. This includes a 10-year phase-out for developing countries identified in Article 5 of the treaty. Chlorofluorocarbons CFCs, phase-out management plan. The stated purpose of the treaty is that the signatory states, recognizing that worldwide emissions of certain substances can significantly deplete and otherwise modify the ozone layer in a manner that is likely to result in adverse effects on human health and the environment. Determined to protect the ozone layer by taking precautionary measures to control equitably total global emissions of substances that depleted with the ultimate objective of their elimination on the basis of developments in scientific knowledge. Acknowledging that special provision is required to meet the needs of developing countries. Shall accept a series of stepped limits on CFC use and production, including from 1991 to 1992 its levels of consumption and production of the controlled substances in Group 1 of Annex A do not exceed 150% of its calculated levels of production and consumption of those substances in 1986. From 1994 its calculated level of consumption and production of the controlled substances in Group 1 of Annex A does not exceed, annually, 25% of its calculated level of consumption and production in 1986. From 1996 its calculated level of consumption and production of the controlled substances in Group 1 of Annex A does not exceed zero. There was a faster phase-out of Halon 1211, minus 2402, 1301, there was a slower phase-out to zero by 2010, of other substances Halon 1211, 1301, 2402, CFCs 13, 111, 112, etc., and some chemicals were given individual attention carbon tetrachloride, 1, 1, 1 trichloroethane. The phasing out of the less damaging HCFCs only began in 1996 and will go on until a complete phasing out is achieved by 2030. 
There were a few exceptions for essential uses, where no acceptable substitutes were initially found, for example, in the past metered dose inhalers commonly used to treat asthma and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease were exempt, or halon fire suppression systems used in submarines and aircraft but not in general industry. The substances in group 1 of Annex A are CFCL3, CFC11, CF2CL2, CFC12, C2F3CL3, CFC113, C2F4CL2, CFC114, C2F5CL, CFC115. The provisions of the protocol include the requirement that the parties to the protocol base their future decisions on the current scientific, environmental, technical, and economic information that is assessed through panels drawn from the worldwide expert communities. To provide that input to the decision-making process, advances in understanding on these topics were assessed in 1989, 1991, 1994, 1998 and 2002 in a series of reports entitled Scientific Assessment of Ozone Depletion, by the Scientific Assessment Panel SAP. In 1990 a Technology and Economic Assessment Panel was also established as the Technology and Economics Advisory Body to the Montreal Protocol Parties. The Technology and Economic Assessment Panel TEAP provides, at the request of parties, technical information related to the alternative technologies that have been investigated and employed to make it possible to virtually eliminate use of ozone-depleting substances such as CFCs and halons that harm the ozone layer. The TEAP is also tasked by the parties every year to assess and evaluate various technical issues including evaluating nominations for essential use exemptions for CFCs and halons, and nominations for critical use exemptions for methyl bromide. TEAP's annual reports are a basis for the parties' informed decision-making. Numerous reports have been published by various intergovernmental, governmental and non-governmental organizations to catalog and assess alternatives to the ozone-depleting substances, since the substances have been used in various technical sectors, like in refrigeration, air conditioning, flexible and rigid foam, fire protection, aerospace, electronics, agriculture, and laboratory measurements. Hydrochlorofluorocarbons HCFCs, Phase Out Management Plan HPMP. Under the Montreal Protocol on Substances that Deplete the Ozone Layer, especially Executive Committee XCOM 5337 and XCOM 5439, parties to this protocol agreed to set year 2013 as the time to freeze the consumption and production of HCFCs for developing countries. For developed countries, reduction of HCFC consumption and production began in 2004 and 2010, respectively, with 100% reduction set for 2020. Developing countries agreed to start reducing its consumption and production of HCFCs by 2015, with 100% reduction set for 2030. Hydrochlorofluorocarbons, commonly known as HCFCs, are a group of human-made compounds containing hydrogen, chlorine, fluorine and carbon. They are not found anywhere in nature. HCFC production began to take off after countries agreed to phase out the use of CFCs in the 1980s, which were found to be destroying the ozone layer. Like CFCs, HCFCs are used for refrigeration, aerosol propellants, foam manufacture and air conditioning. Unlike the CFCs, however, most HCFCs are broken down in the lowest part of the atmosphere and pose a much smaller risk to the ozone layer. Nevertheless, HCFCs are very potent greenhouse gases, despite their very low atmospheric concentrations, measured in parts per trillion million million. The HCFCs are transitional CFCs replacements, used as refrigerants, solvents, blowing agents for plastic foam manufacture, and fire extinguishers. In terms of ozone depletion potential ODP, in comparison to CFCs that have ODP 0.6-1.0, these HCFCs have lower ODPs 0.01-0.5. In terms of global warming potential GWP, in comparison to CFCs that have GWP 4680-10720, HCFCs have lower GWPs 76-2270. Hydrofluorocarbons HFCs. On 1 January 2019 the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol came into force. 23. Under the Kigali Amendment countries promised to reduce the use of hydrofluorocarbons HFCs by more than 80% over the next 30 years. By 27 December 2018, 65 countries had ratified the amendment. Produced mostly in developed countries, hydrofluorocarbons HFCs replaced CFCs and HCFCs. 
HFCs pose no harm to those on layer because, unlike CFCs and HCFCs, they do not contain chlorine. They are, however, greenhouse gases, with a high global warming potential GWP comparable to that of CFCs and HCFCs. In 2009, a study calculated that a fast phase down of high GWP HFCs could potentially prevent the equivalent of up to 8.8 .8 GTCO2 EQ per year in emissions by 2050. A proposed phase down of HFCs was hence projected to avoid up to 0.5 C of warming by 2100 under the high HFC growth scenario, and up to 0.35 C under the low HFC growth scenario. Recognizing the opportunity presented for fast and effective phasing down of HFCs through the Montreal Protocol, starting in 2009 the Federated States of Micronesia proposed an amendment to phase down high GWP HFCs, with the US, Canada, and Mexico following with a similar proposal in 2010. After seven years of negotiations, in October 2016 at the 28th meeting of the parties to the Montreal Protocol in Kigali, the parties to the Montreal Protocol adopted the Kigali Amendment whereby the parties agreed to phase down HFCs under the Montreal Protocol. 32. The amendment to the legally binding Montreal Protocol will ensure that industrialized countries bring down their HFC production and consumption by at least 85% compared to their annual average values in the period 2011-2013. A group of developing countries including China, Brazil and South Africa are mandated to reduce their HFC use by 85% of their average value in 2020-22 by the year 2045. India and some other developing countries Iran, Iraq, Pakistan, and some oil economies like Saudi Arabia and Kuwait will cut down their HFCs by 85% of their values in 2024-26 by the year 2047. On 17 November 2017, ahead of the 29th meeting of the parties of the Montreal Protocol, Sweden became the 20th party to ratify the Kigali Amendment, pushing the amendment over its ratification threshold ensuring that the amendment would enter into force 1 January 2019. 33. In the 1970s, the chemists Frank Sherwood Rowland and Mario Molina, who were then at the University of California, Irvine, began studying the impacts of CFCs in the Earth's atmosphere. They discovered that CFC molecules were stable enough to remain in the atmosphere until they got up into the middle of the stratosphere where they would finally, after an average of 50 to 100 years for two common CFCs be broken down by ultraviolet radiation releasing a chlorine atom. Rowland and Molina then proposed that these chlorine atoms might be expected to cause the breakdown of large amounts of ozone O3 in the stratosphere. Their argument was based upon an analogy to contemporary work by Paul J. Crutzen and Harold Johnston, which had shown that nitric oxide no, could catalyze the destruction of ozone. Several other scientists, including Ralph Cicerone, Richard Stolarski, Michael McElroy, and Stephen Wafsi had independently proposed that chlorine could catalyze ozone loss, but none had realized that CFCs were a potentially large source of chlorine. Crutzen, Molina and Rowland were awarded the 1995 Nobel Prize for Chemistry for their work on this problem. The environmental consequence of this discovery was that, since stratospheric ozone absorbs most of the ultraviolet B UVB radiation reaching the surface of the planet, depletion of the ozone layer by CFCs would lead to an increase in UVB radiation at the surface, resulting in an increase in skin cancer and other impacts such as damage to crops and to marine phytoplankton. But the Roland Molina hypothesis was strongly disputed by representatives of the aerosol and halocarbon industries. The chair of the board of DuPont was quoted as saying that ozone depletion theory is, a science fiction tale, a load of rubbish, utter nonsense. Robert Ablanow, the president of Precision Valve Corporation, an inventor of the first practical aerosol spray can valve, wrote to the chancellor of UC Irvine to complain about Roland's public statements, Roan, page 56. After publishing their pivotal paper in June 1974, Roland and Molina testified at a hearing before the U.S. House of Representatives in December 1974. As a result, significant funding was made available to study various aspects of the problem and to confirm the initial findings. In 1976, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences NAS released a report that confirmed the scientific credibility of the ozone depletion hypothesis. NAS continued to publish assessments of related science for the next decade. Then, in 1985, British Antarctic Survey scientists Joe Farman, Brian Gardiner and John Shanklin published results of abnormally low ozone concentrations above Haley Bay near the South Pole. They speculated that this was connected to increased levels of CFCs in the atmosphere.
It took several other attempts to establish the Antarctic losses as real and significant, especially after NASA had retrieved matching data from its satellite recordings. This unforeseen phenomenon in the Antarctic, as well as NASA's scientific images of the ozone hole played an important role in the Montreal Protocol negotiations. The impact of these studies, the metaphor, ozone hole, and the colorful visual representation in a time-lapse animation proved shocking enough for negotiators in Montreal, Canada to take the issue seriously. Also in 1985, 20 nations, including most of the major CFC producers, signed the Vienna Convention, which established a framework for negotiating international regulations on ozone-depleting substances. After the discovery of the ozone hole by SAGE-2 it only took 18 months to reach a binding agreement in Montreal, Canada. Mustafa Kemal Tolba, the head of the UNEP at the time, was considered the father of the Montreal Protocol for his role in bringing the nations together for an agreement. But the CFC industry did not give up that easily. As late as 1986, the Alliance for Responsible CFC Policy, an association representing the CFC industry founded by DuPont, was still arguing that the science was too uncertain to justify any action. In 1987, DuPont testified before the U.S. Congress that, we believe there is no imminent crisis that demands unilateral regulation. 39 and even in March 1988, DuPont Chair Richard E. Heckert would write in a letter to the United States Senate, we will not produce a product unless it can be made, used, handled and disposed of safely and consistent with appropriate safety, health and environmental quality criteria. At the moment, scientific evidence does not point to the need for dramatic CFC emission reductions. There is no available measure of the contribution of CFCs to any observed ozone change. The main objective of the Multilateral Fund for the Implementation of the Montreal Protocol is to assist developing country parties to the Montreal Protocol whose annual per capita consumption and production of ozone-depleting substances odds, is less than 0.3 kg to comply with the control measures of the protocol. Currently, 147 of the 196 parties to the Montreal Protocol meet these criteria they are referred to as Article 5 countries. It embodies the principle agreed at the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development in 1992 that countries have a common but differentiated responsibility to protect and manage the global commons. The fund is managed by an executive committee with an equal representation of seven industrialized and seven Article 5 countries, which are elected annually by a meeting of the parties. The committee reports annually to the meeting of the parties on its operations. The work of the multilateral fund on the ground in developing countries is carried out by four implementing agencies, which have contractual agreements with the executive committee. United Nations Environment Program, UNEP, through its Ozone Action Program. United Nations Development Program, UNDP. United Nations Industrial Development Organization, UNIDO. World Bank. Up to 20% of the contributions of contributing parties can also be delivered through their bilateral agencies in the form of eligible projects and activities. The fund is replenished on a three-year basis by the donors. Pledges amount to US$3.1 billion United States dollars over the period 1991 to 2005. Funds are used, for example, to finance the conversion of existing manufacturing processes, train personnel, pay royalties and patent rights on new technologies, and establish national ozone offices. As of October 2022, all member states of the United Nations, the Cook Islands, Niue, the Holy See, the State of Palestine as well as the European Union have ratified the original Montreal Protocol, see external link below, with the State of Palestine being the last party to ratify the agreement, bringing the total to 198. 197 of those parties with the exception of the State of Palestine have also ratified the London, Copenhagen, Montreal, and Beijing amendments. 13. Since the Montreal Protocol came into effect, the atmospheric concentrations of the most important chlorofluorocarbons and related chlorinated hydrocarbons have either leveled off or decreased. Halon concentrations have continued to increase, as the halons presently stored in fire extinguishers are released, but their rate of increase has slowed and their abundances are expected to begin to decline by about 2020. Also, the concentration of the HCFCs increased drastically at least partly because of many uses e.g. used as solvents or refrigerating agents CFCs were substituted with HCFCs. While there have been reports of attempts by individuals to circumvent the ban, e.g. by smuggling CFCs from undeveloped to developed nations, the overall level of compliance has been high. 
Statistical analysis from 2010 show a clear positive signal from the Montreal Protocol to the stratospheric ozone. In consequence, the Montreal Protocol has often been called the most successful international environmental agreement to date. In a 2001 report, NASA found the ozone thinning over Antarctica had remained the same thickness for the previous three years, however in 2003 the ozone hole grew to its second largest size. The most recent 2006 scientific evaluation of the effects of the Montreal Protocol states, the Montreal Protocol is working, there is clear evidence of a decrease in the atmospheric burden of ozone-depleting substances and some early signs of stratospheric ozone recovery. However, a more recent study seems to point to a relative increase in CFCs due to an unknown source. Reported in 1997, significant production of CFCs occurred in Russia for sale on the black market to the EU throughout the 90s. Related U.S. production and consumption was enabled by fraudulent reporting due to poor enforcement mechanisms. Similar illegal markets for CFCs were detected in Taiwan, Korea, and Hong Kong. The Montreal Protocol is also expected to have effects on human health. A 2015 report by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency estimates that the protection of the ozone layer under the treaty will prevent over 280 million cases of skin cancer, 1.5 million skin cancer deaths, and 45 million cataracts in the United States. However, the hydrochlorofluorocarbons, or HCFCs, and hydrofluorocarbons, or HFCs, contribute to anthropogenic global warming. On a molecule-for-molecule basis, these compounds are up to 10,000 times more potent greenhouse gases than carbon dioxide. The Montreal Protocol currently calls for a complete phase out of HCFCs by 2030, but does not place any restriction on HFCs. Since the CFCs themselves are equally powerful greenhouse gases, the mere substitution of HFCs for CFCs does not significantly increase the rate of anthropogenic climate change, but over time a steady increase in their use could increase the danger that human activity will change the climate. Policy experts have advocated for increased efforts to link ozone protection efforts to climate protection efforts. Policy decisions in one arena affect the costs and effectiveness of environmental improvements in the other. Regional Detections of Non-Compliance In 2018, scientists monitoring the atmosphere following the 2010 phase-out date have reported evidence of continuing industrial production of CFC-11, likely in Eastern Asia, with detrimental global effects on the ozone layer. A monitoring study detected fresh atmospheric releases of carbon tetrachloride from China's Shandong province, beginning sometime after 2012, and accounting for a large part of emissions exceeding global estimates under the Montreal Protocol. The year 2012 marked the 25th anniversary of the signing of the Montreal Protocol. Accordingly, the Montreal Protocol community organized a range of celebrations at the national, regional and international levels to publicize its considerable success to date and to consider the work ahead for the future. Among its accomplishments are, the Montreal Protocol was the first international treaty to address a global environmental regulatory challenge, the first to embrace the precautionary principle in its design for science-based policymaking, the first treaty where independent experts on atmospheric science, environmental impacts, chemical technology, and economics reported directly to parties, without edit or censorship, functioning under norms of professionalism, peer review, and respect, the first to provide for national differences in responsibility and financial capacity to respond by establishing a multilateral fund for technology transfer, the first MAYA with stringent reporting, trade, and binding chemical phase-out obligations for both developed and developing countries, and, the first treaty with a financial mechanism managed democratically by an executive board with equal representation by developed and developing countries. Within 25 years of signing, parties to the MP celebrate significant milestones. Significantly, the world has phased out 98% of the ozone-depleting substances odds contained in nearly 100 hazardous chemicals worldwide, every country is in compliance with stringent obligations, and, the M phase achieved the status of the first global regime with universal ratification, even the newest member state, South Sudan, ratified in 2013. UNEP received accolades for achieving global consensus that, demonstrates the world's commitment to ozone protection, and more broadly, to global environmental protection.
The Convention on Biological Diversity CBD, known informally as the Biodiversity Convention, is a multilateral treaty. The convention has three main goals. The conservation of biological diversity or biodiversity, the sustainable use of its components, and the fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising from genetic resources. Its objective is to develop national strategies for the conservation and sustainable use of biological diversity, and it is often seen as the key document regarding sustainable development. Type. Multilateral Environmental Agreement. Context. Environmentalism, Biodiversity Conservation. Drafted. The 22nd of May 1992. Signed. The 5th of June 1992 minus 4 June 1993. Location. Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. New York, United States. Effective. The 29th of December 1993. Condition. Ratification by 30 states. Parties. 196 states. All unmember states except the United States. Cook Islands. European Union. Niue. State of Palestine. Depository. Secretary General of the United Nations. Languages. Arabic B. Chines in English and French Russian Spanish. The convention was opened for signature at the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro on 5 June 1992 and entered into force on 29 December 1993. The United States is the only unmember state which has not ratified the convention. 1. It has two supplementary agreements, the Cartagena Protocol and Nagoya Protocol. The Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety to the Convention on Biological Diversity is an international treaty governing the movements of living modified organisms LMOs, resulting from modern biotechnology from one country to another. It was adopted on 29 January 2000 as a supplementary agreement to the CBD and entered into force on of September 2003. The Nagoya Protocol on Access to Genetic Resources and the Fair and Equitable Sharing of Benefits Arising from Their Utilization ABS, to the Convention on Biological Diversity is another supplementary agreement to the CBD. It provides a transparent legal framework for the effective implementation of one of the three objectives of the CBD, the fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising out of the utilization of genetic resources. The Nagoya Protocol was adopted on 29 October 2010 in Nagoya, Japan, and entered into force on 12 October 2014. 2010 was also the International Year of Biodiversity, and the Secretariat of the CBD was its focal point. Following a recommendation of CBD signatories at Nagoya, the UN declared 2011 to 2020 as the United Nations Decade on Biodiversity in December 2010. The Convention's Strategic Plan for Biodiversity 2011-2020, created in 2010, include the Aichi Biodiversity Targets. The meetings of the parties to the Convention are known as Conferences of the Parties COP, with the first one COP1, held in Nassau, Bahamas, in 1994 and the most recent one COP15 in 2021-2022 in Kunming, China and Montreal, Canada. In the area of marine and coastal biodiversity CBD's focus at present is to identify ecologically or biologically significant marine areas EBSAs, in specific ocean locations based on scientific criteria. The aim is to create an international legally binding instrument ILBI, involving era-based planning and decision-making under UNCLOS to support the conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity beyond areas of national jurisdiction BBNJ. The notion of an international convention on biodiversity was conceived at a United Nations Environment Program UNEP, ad hoc working group of experts on biological diversity in November 1988. The subsequent year, the ad hoc working group of technical and legal experts was established for the drafting of a legal text which addressed the conservation and sustainable use of biological diversity, as well as the sharing of benefits arising from their utilization with sovereign states and local communities. In 1991, an intergovernmental negotiating committee was established, tasked with finalizing the convention's text. A conference for the adoption of the agreed text of the Convention on Biological Diversity was held in Nairobi, Kenya, in 1992, and its conclusions were distilled in the Nairobi Final Act. 5. The convention's text was opened for signature on 5 June 1992 at the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development, the Rio, Earth Summit. By its closing date, the 4th of June 1993, the convention had received 168 signatures. It entered into force on the 29th of December 1993.
The convention recognized for the first time in international law that the conservation of biodiversity is a common concern of humankind and is an integral part of the development process. The agreement covers all ecosystems, species, and genetic resources. It links traditional conservation efforts to the economic goal of using biological resources sustainably. It sets principles for the fair and equitable sharing of the benefits arising from the use of genetic resources, notably those destined for commercial use. 6. It also covers the rapidly expanding field of biotechnology through its Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety, addressing technology development and transfer, benefit sharing and biosafety issues. Importantly, the convention is legally binding, countries that join it parties are obliged to implement its provisions. The convention reminds decision makers that natural resources are not infinite and sets out a philosophy of sustainable use. While past conservation efforts were aimed at protecting particular species and habitats, the convention recognizes that ecosystems, species and genes must be used for the benefit of humans. However, this should be done in a way and at a rate that does not lead to the long-term decline of biological diversity. The convention also offers decision-makers guidance based on the precautionary principle which demands that where there is a threat of significant reduction or loss of biological diversity, lack of full scientific certainty should not be used as a reason for postponing measures to avoid or minimize such a threat. The convention acknowledges that substantial investments are required to conserve biological diversity. It argues, however, that conservation will bring a significant environmental, economic and social benefits in return. The Convention on Biological Diversity of 2010 bans some forms of geoengineering. As of 1 December 2019, the Acting Executive Secretary is Elizabeth Maruma Murma. The previous Executive Secretaries were Place, Cristiana Pasca Palmer, 2017-2019, Braulio Ferreira de Souza Dias, 2012-2017, Ahmed Jogloff, 2006-2012, Hamdala Zedin, 1998-2005, Callistus Juma, 1995-1998, and Angela Cropper, 1993-1995. Some of the many issues dealt with under the convention include Measures the incentives for the conservation and sustainable use of biological diversity. Regulated access to genetic resources and traditional knowledge, including prior informed consent of the party providing resources. Sharing, in a fair and equitable way, the results of research and development and the benefits arising from the commercial and other utilization of genetic resources with the contracting party providing such resources, governments and or local communities that provided the traditional knowledge or biodiversity resources utilized. Access to and transfer of technology, including biotechnology, to the governments and or local communities that provided traditional knowledge and or biodiversity resources. Technical and scientific cooperation. Coordination of a global directory of taxonomic expertise, global taxonomy initiative. Impact assessment. Education and public awareness. Provision of financial resources. National reporting on efforts to implement treaty commitments. Conference of the Parties, COP. The Convention's governing body is the Conference of the Parties, COP, consisting of all governments and regional economic integration organizations that have ratified the treaty. This ultimate authority reviews progress under the Convention, identifies new priorities, and sets work plans for members. The COP can also make amendments to the Convention, create expert advisory bodies, review progress reports by member nations, and collaborate with other international organizations and agreements. The Conference of the Parties uses expertise and support from several other bodies that are established by the Convention. In addition to committees or mechanisms established on an ad hoc basis, the main organs are CBD Secretariat The CBD Secretariat, based in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, operates under UNEP, the United Nations Environment Programme. Its main functions are to organize meetings, draft documents, assist member governments in the implementation of the program of work, coordinate with other international organizations, and collect and disseminate information. Subsidiary Body for Scientific, Technical and Technological Advice, SBSTTA. The SBSTT is a committee composed of experts from member governments competent in relevant fields. It plays a key role in making recommendations to the COP on scientific and technical issues. It provides assessments of the status of biological diversity and of various measures taken in accordance with convention, and also gives recommendations to the conference of the parties, which may be endorsed in whole, in part or in modified form by the COPs.
As of 2020 SBSTTA had met 23 times, with a 24th meeting taking place in Geneva, Switzerland in 2022. Subsidiary Body on Implementation SBI. In 2014, the Conference of the Parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity established the Subsidiary Body on Implementation SBI, to replace the ad hoc open-ended working group on review of implementation of the convention. The four functions and core areas of work of SBI are a review of progress in implementation, b. strategic actions to enhance implementation, c. strengthening means of implementation, and d. operations of the convention and the protocols. The first meeting of the SBI was held on the 2nd to the 6th of May 2016 and the second meeting was held on the 9th to the 13th of July 2018, both in Montreal, Canada. The third meeting of the SBI will be held in March 2022 in Geneva, Switzerland. 9th The Bureau of the Conference of the Parties serves as the Bureau of the SBI. The current chair of the SBI is Ms. Charlotta Sorquist of Sweden. As of 2016, the convention has 196 parties, which includes 195 states and the European Union. All unmember states, with the exception of the United States, have ratified the treaty. Non-UN member states that have ratified are the Cook Islands, Niue, and the State of Palestine. The Holy See and the states with limited recognition are non-parties. The U.S. has signed but not ratified the treaty, because ratification requires a two-thirds majority in the Senate and is blocked by Republican Party senators. The European Union created the Cartagena Protocol see below, in 2000 to enhance biosafety regulation and propagate the precautionary principle over the sound science principle defended by the United States. Whereas the impact of the Cartagena Protocol on domestic regulations has been substantial, its impact on international trade law remains uncertain. In 2006, the World Trade Organization WTO, ruled that the European Union had violated international trade law between 1999 and 2003 by imposing a moratorium on the approval of genetically modified organisms GMO imports. Disappointing the United States, the panel nevertheless, decided not to decide, by not invalidating the stringent European biosafety regulations. Implementation by the parties to the convention is achieved using two means. National Biodiversity Strategies and Action Plans NBSAP. National Biodiversity Strategies and Action Plans NBSAP, are the principal instruments for implementing the convention at the national level. The convention requires that countries prepare a national biodiversity strategy and to ensure that this strategy is included in planning for activities in all sectors where diversity may be impacted. As of early 2012, 173 parties had developed NBSAPs. The United Kingdom, New Zealand and Tanzania carried out elaborate responses to conserve individual species and specific habitats. The United States of America, a signatory who had not yet ratified the treaty by 2010, produced one of the most thorough implementation programs through species recovery programs and other mechanisms long in place in the U.S. for species conservation. Singapore established a detailed national biodiversity strategy and action plan. The National Biodiversity Center of Singapore represents Singapore in the Convention for Biological Diversity. National Reports In accordance with Article 26 of the Convention, parties prepare national reports on the status of implementation of the Convention. Strategic Goal C. To improve the status of biodiversity by safeguarding ecosystems, species and genetic diversity. Strategic Goal D. Enhance the benefits to all from biodiversity and ecosystem services. Strategic Goal E. Enhance implementation through participatory planning, knowledge management and capacity building. Upon the launch of Agenda 2030, CBD released a technical note mapping and identifying synergies between the 17 Sustainable Development Goals SDGs and the 20 IG Biodiversity Targets. This helps to understand the contributions of biodiversity to achieving the SDGs. Post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. A new plan, known as the Post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, GBF, was developed to guide action through 2030. A first draft of this framework was released in July 2021, and its final content was discussed and negotiated as part of the COP15 meetings. Reducing agricultural pollution and sharing the benefits of digital sequence information arose as key points of contention among parties during development of the framework. A final version was adopted by the convention on 19 December 2022. 
The framework includes a number of ambitious goals, including a commitment to designate at least 30% of global land and sea as protected areas known as the 30 by 30 inches initiative. Marine and coastal biodiversity. The CBD has a significant focus on marine and coastal biodiversity. A series of expert workshops have been held 2018-2022 to identify options for modifying the description of ecologically or biologically significant marine areas EBSAs and describing new areas. These have focused on the Northeast, Northwest and Southeastern Atlantic Ocean, Baltic Sea, Caspian Sea, Black Sea, Seas of East Asia, Northwest Indian Ocean and adjacent Gulf areas, Southern and Northeast Indian Ocean, Mediterranean Sea, North and South Pacific, Eastern Tropical and Temperate Pacific, Wider Caribbean and Western Mid-Atlantic. The workshop meetings have followed the EBSA process based on internationally agreed scientific criteria. This is aimed at creating an international legally binding instrument ILBI, under UNCLOS to support the conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity beyond areas of national jurisdiction BBNJ. The central mechanism is area-based planning and decision-making. It integrates EBSAs, Vulnerable Marine Ecosystems VMEs, and High Seas Marine Protected Areas with Blue Growth Scenarios. There is also linkage with the EU Marine Strategy Framework Directive. There have been criticisms against CBD that its implementation has been weakened due to resistance of Western countries to the implementation of pro-South provisions of the Convention. CBD is also regarded as a case of a hard treaty gone soft in the implementation trajectory. The argument to enforce the treaty is a legally binding multilateral instrument with the conference of parties reviewing the infractions and non-compliance is also gaining strength. Although the convention explicitly states that all forms of life are covered by its provisions, examination of reports and of national biodiversity strategies and action plans submitted by participating countries shows that in practice this is not happening. The fifth report of the European Union, for example, makes frequent reference to animals particularly fish and plants, but does not mention bacteria, fungi or protists at all, the International Society for Fungal. Conservation has assessed more than 100 of these CBD documents for their coverage of fungi using defined criteria to place each in one of six categories. No documents were assessed as good or adequate, less than 10% is nearly adequate or poor, and the rest is deficient, seriously deficient or totally deficient. Scientists working with biodiversity and medical research are expressing fears that the Nagoya Protocol is counterproductive and will hamper disease prevention and conservation efforts, and that the threat of imprisonment of scientists will have a chilling effect on research. Non-commercial researchers and institutions such as natural history museums fear maintaining biological reference collections and exchanging material between institutions will become difficult, and medical researchers have expressed alarm at plans to expand the protocol to make it illegal to publicly share genetic information, e.g. via GenBank. William Yancey Brown, when with the Brookings Institution, suggested that the Convention on Biological Diversity should include the preservation of intact genomes and viable cells for every known species and for new species as they are discovered. Leading up to the Conference of the Parties COP11 meeting on biodiversity in Hyderabad, India, 2012, preparations for a worldwide views on biodiversity has begun, involving old and new partners and building on the experiences from the worldwide views on global warming. 2014 COP12. Under the theme, Biodiversity for Sustainable Development, thousands of representatives of governments, NGOs, indigenous peoples, scientists and the private sector gathered in Pyeongchang, Republic of Korea in October 2014 for the 12th meeting of the Conference of the Parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity, COP12. From the 6th to the 17th of October 2014, Parties discussed the implementation of the Strategic Plan for Biodiversity 2011-2020 and its Aichi Biodiversity Targets, which are to be achieved by the end of this decade. The results of Global Biodiversity Outlook 4, the flagship assessment report of the CBD informed the discussions. The conference gave a mid-term evaluation to the UN Decade on Biodiversity 2011-2020 initiative, which aims to promote the conservation and sustainable use of nature. The meeting achieved a total of 35 decisions, including a decision on mainstreaming gender considerations to incorporate gender perspective to the analysis of biodiversity. At the end of the meeting, the meeting adopted the Pyeongchang Road Map, which addresses ways to achieve biodiversity through technology cooperation, funding and strengthening the capacity of developing countries. 2016 COP13 COP13 Mexico Meeting 
The 13th Ordinary Meeting of the Parties to the Convention took place between 2 and 17 December 2016 in Cancun, Mexico. 2018 COP14 The 14th Ordinary Meeting of the Parties to the Convention took place on 17 to 29 November 2018, in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt. The 2018 UN Biodiversity Conference closed on 29 November 2018 with broad international agreement on reversing the global destruction of nature and biodiversity loss threatening all forms of life on Earth. Parties adopted the voluntary guidelines for the design and effective implementation of ecosystem-based approaches to climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction. Governments also agreed to accelerate action to achieve the Aichi biodiversity targets, agreed in 2010, until 2020. Work to achieve these targets would take place at the global, regional, national and subnational levels. 2021-2022 COP15 2022 United Nations Biodiversity Conference COP15 Canada Meeting The 15th meeting of the parties was originally scheduled to take place in Kunming, China in 2020, but was postponed several times due to the COVID-19 pandemic. After the start date was delayed for a third time, the convention was split into two sessions. A mostly online event took place in October 2021, where over 100 nations signed the Kunming Declaration on Biodiversity. The theme of the declaration was, Ecological Civilization, Building a Shared Future for All Life on Earth. 21 action-oriented draft targets were provisionally agreed in the October meeting, to be further discussed in the second session, an in-person event that was originally scheduled to start in April 2022, but was rescheduled to occur later in 2022. The second part of COP15 ultimately took place in Montreal, Canada, from 5 to 17 December 2022. At the meeting, the parties to the convention adopted a new action plan, the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. 2024 COP16 The 16th meeting of the parties is scheduled to be held in Turkey in 2024.
Education in India is primarily managed by the state-run public education system, which falls under the command of the government at three levels, central, state and local. Under various articles of the Indian Constitution and the Right of Children to Free and Compulsory Education Act, 2009, free and compulsory education is provided as a fundamental right to children aged 6 to 14. The approximate ratio of the total number of public schools to private schools in India is 10. 3. National Education Budget. Budget. 2.9% of GDP, $112 billion. General Details. Primary Languages. English. Assamese Bengali Boro Dagri Gujarati Hindi Kannada and Kashmiri Konkani Maithili Malayalam Maite Manipuri Marathi Nepali Odaya Punjabi Sanskrit Santali Sindhib Tamil Telugu Urdu and other Indian languages. System type. Federal, state and private. Established. Compulsory education. The 1st of April 2010. Literacy 2011. Total. 77.7%. Male. 84.6%. Female. 70.3 percent enrollment 2011 total n a primary 95 percent secondary 69 percent post secondary 25 percent education in india covers different levels and types of learning such as early childhood education primary education secondary education higher education and vocational education it varies significantly according to different factors, such as location, urban or rural, gender, caste, religion, language, and disability. Education in India faces many challenges and opportunities, such as improving access and quality, reducing disparities and dropouts, increasing enrollment and completion rates, enhancing learning outcomes and employability, strengthening governance and accountability, promoting innovation and technology, and addressing the impact of COVID-19 pandemic. It is influenced by various policies and programs at the national and state levels, such as the National Education Policy 2020, the Samagra Shiksha Abhiyan, the Rashtriya Madhyamik Shiksha Abhiyan, the Midday Meal Scheme, the Betty Bachao Betty Padhao Scheme, and the National Digital Education Architecture. It is also supported by various stakeholders and partners, such as UNICEF, UNESCO, World Bank, civil society organizations, academic institutions, private sector entities, and media outlets. A private school would be eligible for government recognition when it met certain conditions. 16. At the primary and secondary level, India has a large private school system complementing the government-run schools, with 29% of students receiving private education in the 6-14 age group. Certain post-secondary technical schools are also private. The private education market in India had a revenue of US$450 million in 2008, but is projected to be a US$40 billion market. As per the Annual Status of Education Report ASER 2012, 96.5% of all rural children between the ages of 6 to 14 were enrolled in school. This is the fourth annual survey to report enrollment above 96%. India has maintained an average enrollment ratio of 95% for students in this age group from year 2007 to 2014. As an outcome the number of students in the age group 6 to 14 who are not enrolled in school has come down to 2.8% in the academic year 2018 as or 2018. Another report from 2013 stated that there were 229 million students enrolled in different accredited urban and rural schools of India, from class 1 to 12, representing an increase of 2.3 million students over 2002 total enrollment, and a 19% increase in girls' enrollment. While quantitatively India is inching closer to universal education, the quality of its education has been questioned particularly in its government-run school system. While more than 95% of children attend primary school, just 40% of Indian adolescents attend secondary school grades 9 to 12. Since 2000, the World Bank has committed over $2 billion to education in India. Some of the reasons for the poor quality include absence of around 25% of teachers every day. States of India have introduced tests and education assessment system to identify and improve such schools. The Human Rights Measurement Initiative finds that India is achieving only 79.0% of what should be possible at its level of income for the right to education. Although there are private schools in India, they are highly regulated in terms of what they can teach, in what form they can operate must be a non-profit to run any accredited educational institution and all the other aspects of the operation. Hence, the differentiation between government schools and private schools can be misleading. 
However, in a report by Gita Gandhi Kingdon entitled, The Emptying of Public Schools and Growth of Private Schools in India, it is said that for sensible education policy making, it is vital to take account of the various changing trends in the size of the private and public schooling sectors in India. Ignoring these trends involves the risk of poor policies legislation, with adverse effects on children's education. In January 2019, India had over 900 universities and 40,000 colleges. In India's higher education system, a significant number of seats are reserved under affirmative action policies for the historically disadvantaged scheduled castes and scheduled tribes and other backward classes. In universities, colleges, and similar institutions affiliated to the central government, there is a maximum 50% of reservations applicable to these disadvantaged groups, at the state level it can vary. Maharashtra had 73% reservation in 2014, which is the highest percentage of reservations in India. Early education in India commenced under the supervision of a guru or preceptor after initiation. 34. The education was delivered through Gurukula. The relationship between the guru and his shishya students disciples was a very important part of education. 35. Takshasila in modern-day Pakistan is one of the example of ancient higher learning institute in India from possibly 8th century BCE, however, it is debatable whether it could be regarded a university or not in modern sense, since teachers living there may not have had official membership of particular colleges, and there did not seem to have existed purpose-built lecture halls and residential quarters in a taxila, in contrast to the later Nalanda University in eastern India. Nalanda was the oldest university system of education in the world in the modern sense of university. There all subjects were taught in the Pali language. Secular institutions cropped up along Buddhist monasteries. These institutions imparted practical education, e.g. medicine. A number of urban learning centers became increasingly visible from the period between 500 BCE to 400 CE. The important urban centers of learning were Nalanda in modern-day Bihar and Manasa in Nagpur, among others. These institutions systematically imparted knowledge and attracted a number of foreign students to study topics such as Buddhist Pali literature, logic, Pali grammar, etc. Chanakya, a Brahmin teacher, was among the most famous teachers, associated with founding of Mauryan Empire. Shramanas and Brahmanas historically offered education by means of donations, rather than charging fees or the procurement of funds from students or their guardians. Citation needed later, stupas, temples also became centers of education, religious education was compulsory but secular subjects were also taught. Students were required to be brahmacharis or celibates. The knowledge in these orders was often related to the tasks a section of the society had to perform. Arts, crafts, Ayurveda, architecture were taught. With the advent of Islam in India the traditional methods of education increasingly came under Islamic influence. Pre-Mughal rulers such as Qutbi Uddin Abak and other Muslim rulers initiated institutions which imparted religious knowledge. Scholars such as Nizamuddin Aliya and Moinuddin Chishti became prominent educators and established Islamic monasteries. Students from Bukhara and Afghanistan visited India to study humanities and science. Islamic institution of education in India included traditional madrasas and maktabs which taught grammar, philosophy, mathematics, and law influenced by the Greek traditions inherited by Persia and the Middle East before Islam spread from these regions into India. A feature of this traditional Islamic education was its emphasis on the connection between science and humanities. British rule and the subsequent establishment of educational institutions saw the introduction of English as a medium of instruction. Some schools taught the curriculum through vernacular languages with English as a second language. The term, pre-modern, was used for three kinds of schools the Arabic and Sanskrit schools which taught Muslim or Hindu sacred literature and the Persian schools which taught Persian literature. The vernacular schools across India taught reading and writing the vernacular language and arithmetic. British education became solidified into India as missionary schools were established during the 1820s. 18th century. Main article. Durample and Relevance Durample was instrumental in changing the understanding of pre-colonial education in India. Durample primary works are based on documentation by the colonial government on Indian education, agriculture, technology, and arts during the period of colonial rule in India. His pioneering historical research, conducted intensively over a decade, provides evidence from extensive early British administrators' reports of the widespread prevalence of indigenous educational institutions in Bombay, Bengal and Madras presidencies as well as in the Punjab, teaching a sophisticated curriculum, with daily school attendance by about 30% of children aged 6 to 15.
In 1818, the fall of Maratha Empire lead to large parts of India come under British rule. 46 During the decade of 1820-30, detailed surveys of the indigenous education system prevalent in their provinces were conducted by the British. G. L. Prendergast, a member of the Governor's Council in Bombay Presidency, recorded the following about indigenous schools in the 27th of June 1821. I need hardly mention what every member of the board knows as well as I do, that there is hardly a village, great or small, throughout our territories, in which there is not at least one school, and in larger villages more, many in every town, and in large cities in every division, where young natives are taught reading, writing and arithmetic, upon a system so economical, from a handful or two of grain, to perhaps a rupee per month to the schoolmaster, according to the ability of the parents, and at the same time so simple and effectual, that there is hardly a cultivator or petty dealer who is not competent to keep his own accounts with a degree of accuracy, in my opinion, beyond what we meet with amongst the lower orders in our own country. Colonial Period and English Education In 1835, the English Education Act was passed by the British in India. This act made English formal medium of education in all schools and colleges. This act neglected both indigenous schools and mass education, as only the small section of upper-class Indians were educated to become the connecting link between the government and the masses. 4-9 This act is today popularly known as Macaulayism. We must at present do our best to form a class who may be interpreters between us and the millions whom we govern, a class of persons, Indian in blood and color, but English in taste, in opinions, in morals, and in intellect. To that class we may leave it to refine the vernacular dialects of the country, to enrich those dialects with terms of science borrowed from the Western nomenclature, and to render them by degrees fit vehicles for conveying knowledge to the great mass of the population. According to sociologist Hetukar Jha, this act lead to decline of indigenous schools which flourished in villages and towns, and simultaneously, the British policy in 1835 skewed in favor of the filtration theory of education, which worked to block to a significant extent the entry of the middle classes and below. Post-independence. Main article. National policy on education. Since the country's independence in 1947, the Indian government sponsored a variety of programs to address the problems of illiteracy in both rural and urban India. Maulana Abul Kalam Azad, India's first minister of education, envisaged strong central government control over education throughout the country, with a uniform educational system. The union government established the University Education Commission 1948-1949, the Secondary Education Commission 1952-1953, University Grants Commission and the Kothari. Commission 1964-66 to develop proposals to modernize India's education system. The resolution on scientific policy was adopted by the government of Jawaharlal Nehru, India's first prime minister. The Nehru government sponsored the development of high-quality scientific education institutions such as the Indian Institutes of Technology. In 1961, the Union government formed the National Council of Educational Research and Training NCERT, as an autonomous organization that would advise both the Union and state governments on formulating and implementing education policies. 2020. National Education Policy 2020. In 2019, the then Ministry of Education released a draft New Education Policy 2019, which was followed by a number of public consultations. It discusses reducing curriculum content to enhance essential learning, critical thinking and more holistic experiential, discussion-based and analysis-based learning. 55. It also talks about a revision of the curriculum and pedagogical structure from a 10 plus 2 system to a 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4 system design in an effort to optimize learning for students based on cognitive development of children. On 29 July 2020, the Cabinet approved a new national education policy with an aim to introduce several changes to the existing Indian education system, which will be introduced in India till 2026. Hindu, Vedic and Sanskrit Education The Maharshi Sandapani Rashtriya Veda Sanskrit Shiksha Board MSRVSSB, is a national-level school education board which grants the Veda Bhushan 10th and Veda Vibhushan 12th certificates to students of affiliated schools. MSRVSSB certificates are accredited by the Association of Indian Universities AU, and AICTE is the recognized qualifications for admission into other tertiary institutions for a higher degree. Along with the modern subjects, the students are also taught Hindu scriptures, Vedas, Upanishads, Ayurveda and Sanskrit.
Government of India has granted legal authority to MSRVSSB to affiliate and recognize Vedic and Sanskrit schools run by other organizations. MSRVSSB is run by the Maharishi Sandapani Rashtriya Ved Vidya Pratishthan MSRVVP, which already runs several Vedic school and MSRVSSB also accredits schools run by other organizations. Educational Stages School Education Education in India is a concurrent list subject, that is both the Indian central government and the state governments have responsibility for enacting and implementing education policy. The central board and most of the state boards uniformly follow the 10 plus 2 pattern of education. In this pattern, study of 10 years is done in schools and 2 years in junior colleges Maharashtra or higher secondary schools most other states 44 and then 3 years of study for a bachelor's degree. The first 10 years is further subdivided into 8 years of elementary education, 5 years primary school and 3 years middle school, 2 years of secondary education followed by 2 years of higher secondary schools or junior colleges. This pattern originated from the Recommendation of the Education Commission of 1964-66. There are two types of educational institutions in India, one recognized institutions primary school, secondary school, special schools, intermediate schools, colleges and universities who follow courses as prescribed by universities or boards and are also open for inspection by these authorities, two unrecognized institutions which do not fulfill conditions as stated for the recognized ones. Administration Education policy is prepared by the central government and state governments at national and state levels respectively. The National Policy on Education NPE 1986 has provided for environment awareness, science and technology education, and introduction of traditional elements such as yoga into the Indian secondary school system. A significant feature of India's secondary school system is the emphasis on inclusion of the disadvantaged sections of the society. Citation needed professionals from established institutes are often called to support in vocational training. Another feature of India's secondary school system is its emphasis on profession-based vocational training to help students attain skills for finding a vocation of his her choosing. A significant new feature has been the extension of SSA to secondary education in the form of the Rashtriya Madhyamik Shiksha Abhiyan. Rashtriya Madhyamik Shiksha Abhiyan RMSA, which is the most recent initiative of Government of India to achieve the goal of universalization of secondary education USE. It is aimed at expanding and improving the standards of secondary education up to class 10. Curriculum and School Education Boards National Skill Development Agency NSDAS National Skills Qualification Framework NSQF is a quality assurance framework which grades and recognizes levels of skill based on the learning outcomes acquired through both formal or informal means. School boards set the curriculum, conduct standardized exams mostly at 10th and 12th level to award the school diplomas. Exams at the remaining levels also called standard, grade or class, denoting the years of schooling are conducted by the schools. National Council of Educational Research and Training NCERT. The NCERT is the apex body located at New Delhi, capital city of India. It makes the curriculum related matters for school education across India. 6 8 The NCERT provides support, guidance, and technical assistance to a number of schools in India and oversees many aspects of enforcement of education policies. 69 There are other curriculum bodies governing school education system, especially at state level, called SCERTs. State Government Boards of Education Most of the state governments have at least one, State Board of Secondary School Education. However, some states like Andhra Pradesh have more than one. Also the Union Territories do not have a board. Chandigarh, Dadra and Nagar Haveli, Damanandu, and Lakshadweep and Puducherry Lakshadweep share the services with a larger state. The boards set curriculum from grades 1 to 12 for affiliated schools. The Curriculum varies from state to state and has more local appeal with examinations conducted in regional languages in addition to English often considered less rigorous than national curricula such as CBSE or ICSE ISC. Most of these conduct exams at 10th and 12th level, but some even at the 5th and 8th level. Central Board of Secondary Education CBSE, The CBSE sets curriculum from grades 9 to 12 for affiliated schools and conducts examinations at the 10th and 12th levels. Students studying the CBSE curriculum take the All India Secondary School Examination AISSE, at the end of grade 10 and All India Senior School Certificate Examination AISSCE, at the end of grade 12. Examinations are offered in Hindi and English.
Council for the Indian School Certificate Examinations CISCE, CISCE sets curriculum from grades 1 to 12 for affiliated schools and conducts three examinations, namely, the Indian Certificate of Secondary Education ICSE Class Grade 10, the Indian School Certificate ISC Class Grade 12, and the Certificate in Vocational Education CVE Class Grade 12. CISCE English level has been compared to UK's A-levels, this board offers more choices of subjects. CBSE exams at grade 10 and 12 have often been compared with ICSE and ISC examinations respectively. ICSE is generally considered to be more rigorous than the CBSE AISSE grade 10, but the CBSE AISSCE and ISC examinations are almost on par with each other in most subjects with ISC including a slightly more rigorous English examination than the CBSE 12th grade. Examination. The CBSE and ISC are recognized internationally and most universities abroad accept the final results of CBSE and ISC exams for admissions purposes and as proof of completion of secondary school. National Institute of Open Schooling NIOS. The NIOS conducts two examinations, namely, Secondary Examination and Senior Secondary Examination All India, and also some courses in vocational education. National Board of Education is run by Government of India's HRD Ministry to provide education in rural areas and challenged groups in open and distance education mode. Abelot Project started by CBSE to provide high-class affordable education, provides education up to 12th standard. Choice of subjects is highly customizable and equivalent to CBSE. Homeschooled students usually take NIOS or international curriculum examinations as they are ineligible to write CBSE or ISC exams. Hindu, Vedic and Sanskrit Education. The Maharshi Sandapani Rashtriya Veda Sanskrit Shiksha Board MSRVSSB, is a national-level school education board which grants the Veda Bhushan 10th and Veda Vibhushan 12th certificates to students of affiliated schools. MSRVSSB certificates are accredited by the Association of Indian Universities AU, and AICTE is the recognized qualifications for admission into other tertiary institutions for a higher degree. Along with the modern subjects, the students are also taught Hindu scriptures, Vedas, Upanishads, Ayurveda and Sanskrit. Government of India has granted legal authority to MSRVSSB to affiliate and recognize Vedic and Sanskrit schools run by other organizations. MSRVSSB is run by the Maharishi Sandapani Rashtriya Ved Vidya Pratishthan MSRVVP, which already runs several Vedic school and MSRVSSB also accredits schools run by other organizations. Islamic Madrasa. Their boards are controlled by local state governments, or autonomous, or affiliated with Darul Uloom Deoband or Darul Uloom Najal Ulama. Autonomous schools, such as Woodstock School, Sri Aurobindo International Center of Education Puducherry, Pathabhavan and Ananda Marga Gurukula. International Baccalaureate IB, and Cambridge International Examinations K. These are generally private schools that have dual affiliation with one of the School Education Board of India as well as affiliated to the International Baccalaureate IB program and or the Cambridge International Examinations K. International schools, which offer 10th and 12th standard examinations under the International Baccalaureate, Cambridge Senior Secondary Examination Systems or under their home nation school boards such as run by foreign embassies or the expat communities. India has a publicly funded higher education system that is the third largest in the world. The main governing body at the tertiary level is the University Grants Commission, which enforces its standards, advises the government, and helps coordinate between the centre and the state. Accreditation for higher learning is overseen by 15 autonomous institutions established by the University Grants Commission UGC. India is believed to have had a system of higher education as early as 1000 BC. Unlike present-day universities, these ancient learning centers were primarily concerned with dispersing Vedic education. The modern Indian education system finds its roots in colonial legacy. British colonists use the university system as a tool of cultural colonization. Colonial efforts in higher education were carried out initially through the East India Company, followed by the British Parliament and later under direct British rule. The first institution of higher learning set up by the British East India Company was the Calcutta Madrasa in 1781. This was followed by the Asiatic Society of Bengal in 1784, Banaras Sanskrit College in 1791 and Fort William College in 1800. With the Charter Act of 1813, the British Parliament officially declared Indian education as one of the duties of the state.
The same act also removed restrictions on missionary work in British India, thus leading to the establishment of the Evangelist Sri Rampur College in 1818. Thomas Babington Macaulay's famously controversial Minute on Education 1835 reflected the growing support of a Western approach to knowledge over an Oriental one. Soon after, in 1857, the first three official universities were started in Bombay, Mumbai, Calcutta, Kolkata, and Madras, Chennai. Followed by the University of Punjab in 1882 and the University of Allahabad in 1887. These universities were modeled after the University of London and focused on English and the humanities. The British control of the Indian education system continued until the Government of India Act 1935 that transferred more power to provincial politicians and began the Indianization of education. This period witnessed a rise in the importance of physical and vocational education as well as the introduction of basic education schemes. When India gained independence in 1947, the nation had a total of 241,369 students registered across 20 universities and 496 colleges. In 1948, the Indian government established the University Education Commission to oversee the growth and improvement of higher education. In the 1960s and 1970s, the government increased its efforts to support higher education by not only setting up state-funded universities and colleges, but also providing financial assistance to private institutions, resulting in the creation of private-aided grant-in-aid institutions. Despite the departure of the British, Indian higher education continued to give importance to the languages and humanities until the 1980s. Institutes of professional education like the Indian Institutes of Technology IITs Birla Institute of Technology and Science Palani BITS Regional Engineering Colleges REC and Indian Institutes of Management IIM were some of the more prominent exceptions to this trend. These institutions drew inspiration from reputed universities in the United States and also received foreign funding. However, the education system remained using colonial English instead of plain English as many ESL countries do under the view that sophistication of language used in education signifies quality of education instead of the quality of structured knowledge that is transferred. Post-1980s, the changing demands of the global economy, lack of foreign investment and political volatility, decreasing value of currency, and an increased strain on government governance capacity, slowed the growth of state-funded higher educational institutions. This led to an increased role of the private sector in the education system. Year degree, much of what students study in the initial years becomes irrelevant or subject to knowledge erosion. Many foreign countries view the traditional degree pathway, which compels students of working age to halt their careers for half a decade to earn a degree in a digitized academic environment, as less effective and unsuitable for a growing economy especially in a world where 40% of the global population was connected to the Internet in 2015 through 25 billion devices, and where in STEM fields, micro-certificates are a required aspect of lifelong learning to stay relevant, many of these micro-certificates are learning blocks either function as a start of a base of knowledge or add on to an existing base. For example, most programming courses only take three months to learn in an academic setting and the two along with other subjects, and are the only requirement of base knowledge for springboard programming-related tech jobs. Jim Heckman, a Nobel laureate and professor of economics at the University of Chicago, asserts that education should be encapsulated by the six C's, critical thinking, content communication, collaboration, creativity, character, and citizenship. To broaden students' worldviews and instill values such as creativity, character, and citizenship, India needs to focus on introducing elective pathways to liberal arts education. This will facilitate the development of personal management skills, passions, creativity, and foster natural and concerted personal growth. Universities in India have evolved in divergent streams with each stream monitored by an apex body, indirectly controlled by the Ministry of Education and funded jointly by the state governments. Most universities are administered by the states, however, there are 18 important universities called central universities, which are maintained by the union government. The increased funding of the central universities give them an advantage over their state competitors. The University Grants Commission estimated that in 2013-14, 22,849 PhDs and 20,425 MPhil degrees were awarded. Over half of these were in the fields of science, engineering technology, medicine and agriculture. As of 2014-15, over 178,000 students were enrolled in research programs.
Apart from the several hundred state universities, there is a network of research institutions that provide opportunities for advanced learning and research leading up to a PhD in branches of science, technology and agriculture. Several have won international recognition. 25 of these institutions come under the umbrella of the CSIR Council of Scientific and Industrial Research and over 60 fall under the ICAR Indian Council of Agricultural Research. In addition, the Day Department of Atomic Energy and other ministries support various research laboratories. Environment Protection Act, 1986 is an act of the Parliament of India. It was enacted in May 1986 and came into force on 19 November 1986. It has 26 sections and 4 chapters. The act is widely considered to have been a response to the Bhopal gas leak. The act was passed by the Government of India under the Article 253 of the Constitution of India, which empowers the Union Government to enact laws to give effect to international agreements signed by the country. The purpose of the act is to implement the decisions of the United Nations Conference on the Human environment. They relate to the protection and improvement of the human environment and the prevention of hazards to human beings, other living creatures, plants and property. The Act is an umbrella legislation that has provided a framework for the environmental regulation regime in India, which covers all major industrial and infrastructure activities and prohibits and regulates specific activities in coastal areas and eco-sensitive areas. The Act also provides for coordination of the activities of various central and state authorities established under other environment-related laws, such as the Water Act and the Air Act. This Act was enacted by the Parliament of India in 1986. As the introduction says, an Act to provide for the protection and improvement of environment and for matters connected therewith, whereas the decisions were taken at the United Nations Conference on the Human Environment held at Stockholm in June 1972, in which India participated to take appropriate steps for the protection and improvement of human environment. Whereas it is considered necessary further to implement the decisions aforesaid in so far as they relate to the protection and improvement of environment and the prevention of hazards to human beings, other living creatures, plants and property. This was due to Bhopal gas tragedy which was considered as the worst industrial tragedy in India. This Act has four chapters and 26 sections. Chapter 1 consists of preliminary information such as short title, extend, date of commencement and definitions. The definitions are given in the second section of the Act. Chapter 2 describes general powers of central government. Chapter 3 gives the central government the power to take action to protect the environment. Chapter 4 allows government to appoint officers to achieve these objectives. It also gives the government the power to give direction to closure, prohibition or regulation of industry, pollution. The Act has provisions for penalties for contravention of the provisions of the Act in rules, orders and directions. It also gives detail if the offence is done by a company or government department. It says for such offence the in-charge and head of department respectively would be liable for punishment. The areas on which restriction has been imposed by this act include Dune Valley in Uttarakhand, Aravalli regions in Alwar, Rajasthan, coastal zones and ecologically sensitive zones, etc. Introduction Overview The Environment Protection Act EPA, was enacted in 1986 with the objective of providing the protection and improvement of the environment. It empowers the central government to establish authorities charged with the mandate of preventing environmental pollution in all its forms and to tackle specific environmental problems that are peculiar to different parts of the country. The Act is one of the most comprehensive legislations with a pretext to protection and improvement of the environment. Background The roots of the enactment of the EPA lies in the United Nations Conference on the Human Environment held at Stockholm in June. 1972 Stockholm Conference in which India participated to take appropriate steps for the improvement of the human environment. The Act implements the decisions made at the Stockholm Conference. Constitutional Provisions The EPA Act was enacted under Article 253 of the Indian Constitution which provides for the enactment of legislation for giving effect to international agreements. Article 48A of the Constitution specifies that the state shall endeavor to protect and improve the environment and to safeguard the forests and wildlife of the country. Article 51A further provides that every citizen shall protect the environment. Coverage. The Act is applicable to the whole of India including the state of Jammu and Kashmir. Salient features of the EPA Act. Powers of the Central Government. 
The central government shall have the power to take all such measures as it deems necessary or expedient for the purpose of protecting and improving the quality of the environment in coordination with the state governments. The central government is also empowered to plan and execute a nationwide program for the prevention, control and abatement of environmental pollution, lay down standards for the quality of environment in its various aspects, lay down standards for emission or discharge of environmental pollutants from various sources, the restriction of areas in which any industries, operations or processes or class of industries, operations or processes shall, shall not be carried out subject to certain safeguards. The central government may appoint officers under this act for various purposes and entrust them with the corresponding powers and functions. The central government as per the act has the power to direct the closure, prohibition or regulation of any industry, operation or process, the stoppage or regulation of the supply of electricity or water or any other service, restriction on pollutant discharge. No individual or organization shall discharge, emit or permit to discharge, emit any environmental pollutant in excess of the prescribed standards. Compliance with procedural safeguards. No individual shall handle or shall be caused to handle any hazardous substance except in accordance with the procedure and without complying with the safeguards, as prescribed. Powers of entry and inspection. Any person empowered by the central government shall have a right to enter, with the assistance deemed necessary, at any place. For the inspection of compliance of any orders, notifications and directions given under the Act. For the purpose of examining, and if required seizing, any equipment, industrial plant, record, register, document or any other material object may furnish evidence of the commission of an offense punishable under this Act. Establishment of environmental laboratories. The central government, as per the Act, is entitled to establish environmental laboratories. Recognize any laboratory or institute as environmental laboratories to carry out the functions entrusted to such a laboratory. The central government is also entitled to make rules specifying the functions of environmental laboratories. Appointment of government analyst. A government analyst is appointed by the central government for the analyzing the samples of air, water, soil or other substance sent to a recognized environmental laboratory. Penalties for offenses. Non-compliance or contravention to any of the provisions of the Act is considered as an offense. Any offenses under the EPA are punishable with the imprisonment of up to five years or a fine up to one lakh rupees or both. Offenses by companies. If an offense under this Act is committed by a company, every person directly in charge of the company, at the time of the commitment of offense, is deemed to be guilty unless proven otherwise. Offenses by government departments. If an offense under this act has been committed by any department of government, the head of the department HOD shall be deemed to be guilty of the offense unless proven otherwise. Any officer, other than HOD, if proven guilty, shall also be liable to be proceeded against and punished accordingly. Cognizance of offenses. No court shall take cognizance of any offense under this act except on a complaint made by the central government or any authority on behalf of the former. A person who has approached the courts after a 60-day notice has been furnished to the central government or the authority on its behalf. Drawbacks of the Act Complete centralization of the Act A potential drawback of the Act could be its centralization. While such wide powers are provided to the center and no powers to the state governments, the former is liable to its arbitrariness and misuse. No public participation The Act also says nothing about public participation as regards environmental protection. There is a need to involve the citizens in environmental protection to check arbitrariness and raise awareness and empathy towards the environment. Incomplete coverage of pollutants. The Act does not address modern concept of pollution such as noise, overburdened transport system and radiation waves which are also an important cause for the deteriorating environment. National Environment Appellate Authority NEAA, and National Green Tribunal NGT. It was established by the central government under the, the National Environment Appellate Authority Act, 1997. NIA established to hear appeals regarding the restriction of areas in which any industries, processes or operations shall be, shall not be carried out subject to certain safeguards under the Environment Protection Act, 1986. However, NEEA, along with the National Environment Tribunal, was found to be inadequate giving rise to the demand for an institution to deal with environmental cases more efficiently and effectively. 
As a result, the National Green Tribunal NGT, was established in 2010 under the National Green Tribunal Act 2010 for effective and expeditious disposal of cases relating to environmental protection. Along with the Environment Protection Act, 1986, NGT also deals with civil cases under six other laws. Important notifications issued under EPA. The Coastal Regulation Zone Notification, 1991, which regulates activities along coastal stretches. In December 2018, the Union Cabinet approved the Coastal Regulation Zone, CRZ, Notification, 2018. The Environmental Impact Assessment of Development Projects Notification. International Conventions for Environment Protection to which India is a signatory. The Montreal Protocol to the Vienna Convention on Substances that Deplete the Ozone Layer, 1987. Basel Convention on Transboundary Movement of Hazardous Wastes, 1989. Rotterdam Convention, 1998. Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants, POPs. UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC, 1992. Convention on Biological Diversity, 1992. Unconvention to Combat Desertification, 1994. International Tropical Timber Agreement and the International Tropical Timber Organization, ITTO, 1983, 1994. The ITO established by the International Tropical Timber Agreement, ITTA, 1983, came into force in 1985 and became operational in 1987. The ITO facilitates discussion, consultation and international cooperation on issues relating to the international trade and utilization of tropical timber and the sustainable management of its resource base. The successor agreement to the ITTA 1983, was negotiated in 1994 and came into force on 1 January 1997. The organization has 57 member countries. India ratified the ITTA in 1996. The International Solar Alliance ESA, is an alliance of more than 120 signatory countries, most being sunshine countries, which lie either completely or partly between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. The primary objective of the alliance is to work for the efficient consumption of solar energy to reduce dependence on fossil fuels. This initiative was first proposed by Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi in a speech in November 2015 at Wembley Stadium, London Ha 90WS, United Kingdom, in which he referred to sunshine countries as Suryaputra, Sons of the Sun. The alliance is a treaty-based intergovernmental organization. Countries that do not fall within the tropics can join the alliance and enjoy all benefits as other members, with the exception of voting rights. Bangladesh boasts the world's most extensive off-grid solar power initiative, a valuable source of insights and guidance for other nations seeking to enhance availability of economical and eco-friendly electricity. Through the utilization of solar energy, this initiative has facilitated electricity access for 20 million residents of Bangladesh. The initiative was launched by Prime Minister Narendra Modi at the India-Africa Summit, and a meeting of member countries ahead of the 2015 United Nations Climate Change Conference in Paris in November 2015. The framework agreement of the International Solar Alliance opened for signatures in Marrakesh, Morocco, in November 2016, and 102 countries joined. The ESA is headquartered in Haryana, India. In January 2016, Narendra Modi and the then French President François Hollande jointly laid the foundation stone of the ESA headquarters and inaugurated the Interim Secretariat at the National Institute of Solar Energy NICE, in Gwalpahari, Gurugram, India. The Indian government has dedicated five acres of land on the NICE campus for its future headquarters. It also has contributed 1.75 billion rupees, 22 million United States dollars, to the fund to build a campus and for meeting expenditures for the first five years. The alliance is also called International Agency for Solar Policy and Application IASPA. The focus is on solar power utilization. The launching of such an alliance in Paris also sends a strong signal to the global communities about the sincerity of the developing nations towards their concern about climate change and to switch to a low-carbon growth path.
India has pledged a target of installing 175 gigawatts of renewable energy of which 100 gigawatts will be solar energy by 2022 and reduction in emission intensity by 33-35% by 2030 to let solar energy reach to the most unconnected villages and communities and also towards creating a clean planet. India's pledge to the Paris summit offered to bring 40% of its electricity generation capacity not actual production from non-fossil sources renewable, large hydro, and nuclear by 2030. It is based on world cooperation. The area of Earth located in between the Tropic of Cancer and Tropic of Capricorn is called the Tropical Torrid Zone. This is the part of the world in which the sun can appear directly overhead, and that more direct exposure means that the sun's actual effect is greater here. Anywhere north or south of this zone, sunlight always reaches the Earth's surface at an angle and is correspondingly less intense. The sunniest countries of the world are on the African continent, ranging from Somalia Horn of Africa, east to Niger, west and north to Egypt. For India, possible additional benefits from the alliance can be a strengthening of ties with the major African countries and increasing goodwill for India among them. The alliance is a treaty-based intergovernmental organization. The framework agreement of the International Solar Alliance opened for signatures in Marrakesh, Morocco, in November 2016, on the sidelines of the Marrakesh Climate Change Conference the 22nd session of the Conference of the Parties, or COP22. On its first day, the 15th of November, 16 countries signed the agreement. India, Brazil, the Democratic Republic of Congo, the Dominican Republic, the Republic of Guinea, Mali, Nauru, Niger, Tanzania, Tuvalu, Cambodia, Ethiopia, Burkina Faso, Bangladesh and Madagascar. By the 17th of November, Guinea-Bissau, Fiji, France also signed the agreement. On the 6th of November 2017, India's External Affairs Minister Sushma Swaraj held a meeting with Guinea's Foreign Minister, Mamadi Touré. During the course of this meeting, Mamadi Touré handed over Guinea's instrument of accession to the India-initiated International Solar Alliance ISA. Vanuatu and Liberia also signed the agreement. Subsequently, an additional 107 countries joined the agreement, INCL. Many major countries, such as the United States, Japan, Algeria, Peru, Chile, Paraguay, France, Brazil, India, Argentina and Australia. A conclave started from 30 November 2015 for the Sunshine Grouping, called the INSPA International Agency for Solar Policy and Application. Parties that signed ratified the framework of ESA. The following countries are the prospective members of this alliance that signed the framework. Citation needed countries marked with a plus also ratified the framework, such as Afghanistan, Algeria, Argentina, Bahrain, Barbados, Belgium, Belize, Bhutan, Botswana, Brunei Darussalam, Bulgaria, Cameroon, Chile, Congo, Denmark, El Salvador, Finland, France, Grenada, Guatemala, Haiti, Ireland, Italy, Jamaica, Japan, Liberia, Luxembourg, Maldives, Marshall Islands, Morocco, Myanmar, Nicaragua, Oman, Paraguay, the Philippines, Romania, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Samoa, Thailand, Trinidad and Tobago and the United States, and Brazil is the newest member of this alliance. Greece and Israel formally joined ESA in 2021. Armenia joined in 2023. The alliance partnered with World Bank to launch Global Solar Atlas at an ESA event at the World Future Energy Summit in Abu Dhabi. Global Solar Atlas is a free online tool that displays annual average solar power potential at any location in the world and thus identify potential sites for solar power generation. The World Bank announced, this tool will help governments save millions of dollars on their own research and provide investors and solar developers with an easily accessible and uniform platform to compare resource potential between sites in one region or across multiple countries. Ricardo Politi, Senior Director and Head of the World Bank's Energy and Extractives Global Practice said, the World Bank is seeing a surge of interest from our clients in solar power as a result of the dramatic cost decreases over the past few years. We hope that the Global Solar Atlas will help inform the crucial planning and investment decisions that will need to be taken over the next decade to shift to more sustainable forms of energy. India, with the support of France, invited multiple nations, such as the United States, Japan and Brazil, to facilitate the infrastructure for the implementation of solar projects. The alliance committed $1 trillion as investment, and it is committed to making the costs of solar power more affordable for remote and inaccessible communities. The alliance would endorse India in achieving its goal of generating 100 gigawatts of solar energy and 175 gigawatts of renewable energy by 2022.
The countries would support each other in research and development as well as other high-level activities. It was also seen as an alliance by the developing countries to form a united front and to undertake research and development for making solar power equipment within developing countries, such as Algeria, Argentina and Chile. The total global solar power capacity reached the milestone of 1 terawatt on 13 April 2022. Citation needed earlier, in 2021, the United States reached the milestone of 100 gigawatts of solar power while Brazil reached the milestone of 10 gigawatts. In 2022, Japan announced that it would reach 100 GW of solar power at some time between 2023 and 2026. On 30 June 2016, the alliance entered into an understanding with the World Bank for accelerating mobilization of finance for solar energy. The bank will have a major role in mobilizing more than US$1 trillion United States dollars in investments that will be needed by 2030 to meet ESA's goals for the massive deployment of affordable solar energy. As of 2023, the framework agreement of the ISA was signed by multiple countries, such as the United States, Japan, France, India, Brazil, Australia, Argentina, Chile and Algeria, and ratified by 52 other countries. With ratifications by 15 countries, the ESA would become a treaty-based intergovernmental international organization and it would be recognized by UN legally to become fully functionable. At the World Future Energy Summit WFES, held in Abu Dhabi in January 2018, the government of India announced the establishment of a $350 million solar development fund to enable the financing of solar projects. The International Solar Alliance ESA, is an action-oriented, member-driven, collaborative platform for increased deployment of solar energy technologies as a means for bringing energy access, ensuring energy security, and driving energy transition in its member countries. The ESA strives to develop and deploy cost-effective and transformational energy solutions powered by the sun to help member countries develop low-carbon growth trajectories, with particular focus on delivering impact in countries categorized as least developed countries LDCs and the Small Island Developing States SIDS. Being a global platform, ESA's partnerships with multilateral development banks MDBs, development financial institutions DFIs, private and public sector organizations, civil society and other international institutions is key to delivering the change it seeks to see in the world going ahead. The ESA is guided by its, towards 1,000 feet strategy which aims to mobilize 1,000 billion United States dollars of investments in solar energy solutions by 2030, while delivering energy access to 1,000 million people using clean energy solutions and resulting in installation of 1,000 gigawatts of solar energy capacity. This would help mitigate global solar emissions to the tune of 1,000 million tons of CO2 every year. For meeting these goals, the ESA takes a programmatic approach. Currently, the ESA has nine comprehensive programs, each focusing on a distinct application that could help scale deployment of solar energy solutions. Activities under the programs focuses on three priority areas analytics and advocacy, capacity building, and programmatic support, that help create a favorable environment for solar energy investments to take root in the country. The ISA was conceived as a joint effort by India and France to mobilize efforts against climate change through deployment of solar energy solutions. It was conceptualized on the sidelines of the 21st Conference of Parties COP21 to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change UNFCCC, held in Paris in 2015. With the amendment of its framework agreement in 2020, all member states of the United Nations are now eligible to join the ESA. At present, 116 countries are signatories to the ESA framework agreement, of which 94 countries have submitted the necessary instruments of ratification to become full members of the ISA. Prior to joining ESA, Drive, Mother was Director General of the Energy and Resources Institute Terry. At Terry, he has spearheaded the move to accelerate action towards a low-carbon and cleaner economy through the promotion and adoption of renewable energy and green hydrogen in the Indian electricity sector, enhancing efficiency in buildings and industry, and promoting environmental quality through institutional and policy measures to enhance air quality across the country, adoption of resource efficiency and waste recycling measures, and biotechnology-based solutions, especially for agricultural and industrial environment improvement. He was co-chair of the Global Energy Transitions Commission, and of the Clean Cooling Initiatives of the One Planet Summit. 
He earlier headed the Indian Bureau of Energy Efficiency and was responsible for its foundational programs which mainstreamed energy efficiency through initiatives such as the Star Labeling Program for Appliances, the Energy Conservation Building Code, and the Perform, Achieve and Trade Program for Energy Intensive Industries. He was a leading climate change negotiator and was the Indian spokesperson at the Paris Climate Negotiations. He served as the interim director of the Green Climate Fund during its foundational period, Education and Training Drive. Mathur received a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from the then University of Roorkee and master's and PhD degrees from the University of Illinois. He has also received the Distinguished Alumnus Awards from both his alma maters, awards he was appointed a Chevalier de l'Ordre National du Mérite by the President of France in recognition of his outstanding commitment to the preservation of the environment and coping with energy-related challenges. Abbreviation. ESA. Formation. The 30th of November 2015. Founded at. Paris, France. Purpose. Bring together a group of nations to endorse clean energy, sustainable environment, public transport and climate. Region served. All members of UN. Fields. Renewable energy. Membership. 120 plus members of UN. INCL the United States, Japan, France, Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Algeria and Australia etc. Official language. French, English. Director General. Ajay Mother. Website. International Solar Alliance. Swayam Prabhe An initiative of the Ministry of Education to provide 80 high-quality educational channels through DTH, direct to home, across the length and breadth of the country on 24x7 basis. It has curriculum-based course content covering diverse disciplines. This is primarily aimed at making quality learning resources accessible to remote areas where internet availability is still a challenge. The DTH channels are using the GSAT-15 satellite for program telecasts. Scope of the channels. Channels. The Sway Amprabha has new content every day for at least four hours which would be repeated five more times in a day, allowing the students to choose the time of their convenience. The channels are uplinked from BISAG, Gandhinagar. The contents are provided by NPTEL, IITs, UGC, CEC, IGNOW, NCERT and NIOS. The Inflibnet Center maintains the web portal. The DTH channels covers the following. Higher education. Curriculum-based course contents at postgraduate and undergraduate level covering diverse disciplines such as arts, science, commerce, performing arts, social sciences and humanities, engineering, technology, law, medicine, agriculture, etc. All courses would be certification ready in their detailed offering through SWAYAM, the platform being developed for offering MOOCs courses. School education 912 levels modules for teachers training as well as teaching and learning aids for children of India to help them understand the subjects better and also help them in preparing for competitive examinations for admissions to professional degree programs. Curriculum-based courses that can meet the needs of lifelong learners of Indian citizens in India and abroad. Assist students class 11th and 12th prepare for competitive exams. Sway a Missan Indian Government Portal for Free Open Online Course MOOC platform providing educational courses for university and college learners.
The SWAYAM initiative was launched by the then Ministry of Human Resource Development MHRD, now Ministry of Education, Government of India under Digital India to give a coordinated stage and free entry to web courses, covering all advanced education, high school, and skill sector courses. It was launched on 9 July 2017 by Pranav Mukherjee, Honorable President of India. SWAYAM has been developed cooperatively by MHRD, Ministry of Human Resource Development, and AICTE, All India Council for Technical Education, with the help of Microsoft. The current SWAYAM platform is equipped for facilitating 2,000 courses. The platform offers free access to everyone and hosts courses from class 9 to post-graduation. It enables professors and faculty of centrally funded institutes like IITs, IIMs, IISERs, etc. to teach students. According to SWAYAM, there are 203 partnering institutes, 2,748 completed courses, 12,541,992 student enrollments, 915,538 exam registrations, and 654,664 successful certificates. SWAYAM, meaning, self, in Sanskrit, is an acronym that stands for, Study Webs of Active Learning for Young Aspiring Minds. SWAYAM operates MOOCs learning resources in different ways and structures. Learning is delivered in four ways, e-tutorial, e-content, discussion forums and, self-assessment. 8. The first quadrant is direct teaching, which means that there is not much extra work by students. It could include teaching video, animation, PowerPoint presentations, podcast, and so on. These will depend on the individual subject and the strategy adopted by the teacher. The second quadrant is an e-content which could include e-books, illustrations, case studies, open source content, reference links, further reading sources, etc. The third quadrant is about clearing students' queries where students can interact with each other and faculty. Any student or faculty can answer a student's question. The fourth quadrant is self-assessment to check what a student has studied and whether they are eligible to get a certificate. This includes tests in the form of multiple choice questions, MCQs, quiz or short answer questions, long answer questions, etc. The fourth quadrant also has frequently asked questions, FAQs, and their answers to clarify common misconceptions among students. The University Grants Commission UGC, considers that universities should play a key role in publicizing and popularizing SWAYAM courses among their learners and the university, enabling them to gain from MOOCs on a more extensive footing. Nine national coordinators are appointed to manage the course content. Each coordinator is assigned a particular area for maintenance. All India Council for Technical Education AICTE, has been appointed as a national coordinator by MHRDFOR self-paced and international courses. National Program on Technology Enhanced Learning NPTEL, has been as a appointed national coordinator by MHRD for engineering sector courses. University Grants Commission UGC, has been appointed as a national coordinator by MHRD for non-technical postgraduate education. Consortium for Educational Communication, CEC, has been appointed as a national coordinator by MHRD for undergraduate education. National Council of Educational Research and Training, NCERT, has been appointed as a national coordinator by MHRD for school education. National Institute of Open Schooling, NIOS, has been appointed as a national coordinator by MHRD FOR school education. Indira Gandhi National Open University IGNAU, has been appointed as a national coordinator by MHRDFOR out-of-school students. Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore IIMB, has been appointed as a national coordinator by MHRDFOR Management Studies. National Institute of Technical Teachers Training and Research NITTTR, has been appointed as a national coordinator by MHRD for teacher training program. The National Assessment and Accreditation Council NAAC, was established in 1994 as an autonomous institution of the University Grants Commission UGC, with its headquarter in Bengaluru. The mandate of NAAC is reflected in its vision statement as in making quality assurance an integral part of the functioning of higher education institutions' highs.
The NAAC functions through its General Counsel GC and Executive Committee EC comprising educational administrators, policymakers and senior academicians from a cross-section of Indian higher education system. The chairperson of the UGC is the president of the GC of the NAAC. The chairperson of the EC is an eminent academician nominated by the president of GC NAAC. The director is the academic and administrative head of NAAC and is the member secretary of both the GC and the EC. In addition to the statutory bodies that steer its policies and core staff to support its activities, NAAC is advised by the advisory and consultative committees constituted from time to time. Vision and Mission Vision To make quality the defining element of higher education in India through a combination of self and external quality evaluation, promotion and sustenance initiatives. Mission to arrange for periodic assessment and accreditation of institutions of higher education or units thereof, or specific academic programs or projects. To stimulate the academic environment for the promotion of quality of teaching learning and research in higher education institutions. To encourage self-evaluation, accountability, autonomy and innovations in higher education. To undertake quality-related research studies, consultancy and training programs. To collaborate with other stakeholders of higher education for quality evaluation, promotion and sustenance. Value Framework To promote the following core values among the highs of the country. Contributing to national development. Fostering global competencies among students. Inculcating a value system among students. Promoting the use of technology. Quest for excellence. Assessment and accreditation. The NAC has been set up to facilitate the volunteering institutions to assess their performance vis a vis set parameters through introspection and a process that provides space for participation of the institution. Benefits of accreditation Institution to know its strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities through an informed review process. Identification of internal areas of planning and resource allocation. Collegiality on the campus. Funding agencies look for objective data for performance funding. Institutions to initiate innovative and modern methods of pedagogy. New sense of direction and identity for institutions. The society look for reliable information on quality education offered. Employers look for reliable information on the quality of education offered to the prospective recruits. Intra and inter-institutional interactions. Eligibility criteria. Higher education institutions HEIs, with a record of at least two batches of students graduated or been in existence for six years, whichever is earlier, are eligible to apply for the process of assessment and accreditation ANA of NAAC and fulfill all the specified conditions. Units of assessment NAAC's instrument is developed to assess and grade institutions of higher education through a three-step process and make the outcome as objective as possible. Though the methodology and the broad framework of the instrument is similar, there is a slight difference in the focus of the instrument depending on the unit of accreditation, i.e., affiliated constituent colleges, autonomous colleges, universities, health science teacher, physical education. Criteria and weightages. NAC has identified a set of seven criteria to serve as the basis of its assessment procedures. Notch has categorized the higher educational institutions into three major types university, autonomous college, and affiliated constituent college, and assigned different weightages to these criteria under different key aspects based on the functioning and organizational focus of the three types of highs. The criterion wise differential weightages for the three types of highs are curricular aspects, teaching learning and evaluation, research, innovations and extension, infrastructure and learning resources. Student support and progression. Governance, leadership and management. Institutional values and best practices. Grading. Institutions are graded for each key aspect under four categories, viz. A, B, C and D, denoting very good, good, satisfactory and unsatisfactory levels respectively. The summated score for all the key aspects under a criterion is then calculated with the appropriate weightage applied to it and the GPA is worked out for the criterion. The cumulative GPA, CGPA, which gives the final assessment outcome, is then calculated from the seven GPAs pertaining to the seven criteria, after applying the prescribed weightage to each criterion. Grievance redressal. To provide a review mechanism for institutions who are aggrieved about the process or its outcome or any other issues related thereof, the NAAC has evolved grievance redressal guidelines. Reassessment. 
Institutions, which would like to make an improvement in the accredited status, may volunteer for reassessment after completing at least one year, but not after the completion of three years. The option can be exercised only once in a cycle. The reassessed institution cannot come for another reassessment in the same cycle. Cycles of accreditation. Institutions, which would like to make an improvement in the accredited status, may volunteer for reassessment after completing at least one year but not after the completion of three years. Assessment outcome. The final result of the assessment and accreditation exercise will be an ICT-based score, which is a combination of evaluation of qualitative and quantitative metrics. This will be compiled as a document comprising three parts. Peer team report. Graphical representation based on quantitative metrics, QNM. Institutional grade sheet. India has one of the largest and diverse education systems in the world. Privatization, widespread expansion, increased autonomy and introduction of programs in new and emerging areas have improved access to higher education. At the same time, it has also led to widespread concern on the quality and relevance of the higher education. To address these concerns, the National Policy on Education NPE, 1986, and the Program of Action POA, 1992, spelled out strategic plans for the policies, advocated the establishment of an independent national accreditation agency. Consequently, the National Assessment and Accreditation Council NAAC, was established in 1994 as an autonomous institution of the University Grants Commission UGC, with its headquarter in Bengaluru. The mandate of NAAC is reflected in its vision statement as in making quality assurance an integral part of the functioning of higher education institutions highs. The NAAC functions through its General Council GC, and Executive Committee EC, comprising educational administrators, policymakers and senior academicians from a cross-section of Indian higher education system. The chairperson of the UGC is the president of the GC of the NAAC, the chairperson of the EC is an eminent academician nominated by the president of GC NAAC. The director is the academic and administrative head of NAAC and is the member secretary of both the GC and the EC. In addition to the statutory bodies that steer its policies and core staff to support its activities NAAC is advised by the advisory and consultative committees constituted from time to time. NACW was established in 1994 in response to recommendations of national policy in education. 1986. This policy was to address the issues of deterioration in quality of education, and the Program of Action POA 1992 laid out strategic plans for the policies including the establishment of an independent national accreditation body. Consequently, the NAAC was established in 1994 with its headquarters at Bengaluru. The NAX grades institutes on an 8-grade ladder. Range of institutional CGPA letter grade performance descriptor. 3.514.00 A++ accredited. 3.263.50 A++ accredited. 3.013.25 A. Accredited. 2.763.00 B++ accredited. 2.512.75 B++ accredited. 2.012.50 B. 1.512.00 C. Is less than or equal to 1.50 D. Accredited. Accredited. Not accredited. As of June 2023, 820 universities and 15,501 colleges were accredited by NAAC. Agency Overview. Formed. 1994. 29 years ago. Jurisdiction. India. Headquarters. Bangalore, Karnataka, India. Motto. Excellence Credibility Relevance. Agency Executive. Professor. Anil Sahasrabud, Director. Parent Department. Ministry of Education. Parent Agency. UGC. Website. www.naac.gov.in.